Uh, I think Hurt said I was going to preach his sermon. Did, is that what he said? Did he say something like that? I was out in the lobby, and what did you say, Lee? And that's what I thought you said. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I thought about it, and uh, I asked God, and he said, don't you in any case preach Hurt's sermon. The only one that can preach Lee Hurt's sermon is Lee Hurt, so I guess that's what we're going to do this morning. Thanks, anyway, for thinking of me. Uh, what a privilege to be back here for the 40th anniversary of this great church. Lorraine and I were here when we celebrated our 25th anniversary. Uh, that was my last year to serve here, and so almost 15 years have gone by. I remember when I came here and I realized what strong and wide shoulders I was standing upon. I didn't know Wes Neal personally, but, and then Dick Peterson, and then Jerry Elrod, and then Bill Benlinger, and then we came to be followed by some wonderful men and women who are continuing to lead this church forward. And so what a privilege it is for us to be here this morning. And a privilege for me personally to stand behind this pulpit for another opportunity to preach. Also to hear the choir in what was such a triumphant anthem. And to hear Alleluia by Mozart, one of my favorite pieces. And then the Miriam dancers. And so thank you for the invitation to join you for this 40th anniversary. Now let the words of my mouth I was born in the Methodist Church. I was born in the Methodist Church, the son of a Methodist minister. His father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were also Methodist ministers. I was baptized in the Methodist Church, and a director of Vacation Bible School explained to us children the prayer we could pray to receive Jesus as our Savior. That was in a Methodist Church in Central Illinois. Years later, on a summer evening, as the sun went down and I was standing outside looking across the fields of corn towards the western horizon, I felt the call to the Methodist ministry. I would be the fifth generation of my family to do so. My call was to preach the gospel in the United Methodist Church. I was to be a bringer of good news 36 years later, I was appointed pastor of Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church. That was in July of 2000. I began my ministry here with the words, let me tell you first of all, how much God loves you. How much he loves you. And my first sermon was entitled, The Shepherd of the Hills. I've chosen that same title for today's sermon. It seemed fitting then, and it seems so now, to speak of that good shepherd from whom the church, this church, takes her name. And so once again, it is, once again, it, it is my privilege to preach the gospel in the United Methodist Church and to be a bringer of good news. A number of hills figure in the ministry of Jesus the shepherd. Come with me to one of them. On this hill he preached his best known sermon. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 says when he saw the crowds he went up the hills and after he sat down he began to speak and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He finished his list of beatitudes and Read, uh, went on to sins of the heart, the Lord's Prayer, and the Golden Rule. Many of you here this morning will remember when Reverend Franklin Green would deliver that sermon by memory. 
as they walked up and down the aisles of this sanctuary. Jesus, the shepherd of the hills, went up a hill, sat down, and taught the people. And the text states that when Je Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. But of course, where there are hills, there are also valleys. And when the shepherd came down from the hill of teaching, he, he encountered great need. First, a leper who said, Sir, if you choose, you can heal me. To which Jesus responded, Oh, I do choose. And he reached out and touched the leper. And the leper was clean. Later, he met a centurion, a Roman centurion, who pleaded with him to bring healing to his servant. And the centurion said, don't even trouble yourself to come to my home. Just say the word, and it will be done. And Jesus admired the man's faith and said the word, and the servant was healed from that moment. And later that day, the shepherd of the hills entered the home of the apostle Peter, and Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. And Jesus lifted her up, and she was healed, and she began to serve them. From the hill upon which Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount to the Valley of Need, the shepherd of the hills carried out his mission of love. Now to another hill. Jesus the shepherd had been ministering to the crowds all day, including feeding 5,000 of them from five loaves and two fish. As the day was ending, he told the disciples to get into a boat and go ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. After he said farewell to them, he went up into the hills surrounding the lake to pray. And there we find the shepherd of the hills spending long hours praying in the hills above the sea. Later that night, he saw his disciples in the boat struggling to make their way against a strong wind. He left the hills of prayer and went down to the sea of danger. He approached his men, walking on the water, thinking he was a dangerous spirit. They cried out in fear. He spoke to them. He spoke to them. Take heart. It is I. Have no fear. Then he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased. How easy it is for us to lose heart. In this world of trial and trouble, the shepherd of the hills leaves the safety of the hills and approaches us as we struggle to navigate our little craft upon the difficult sea. And he says to us, take heart. Take heart, it is I. Have no fear. From the Sermon on the Mount to the Valley of Need, from the hills of prayer to the stormy sea of fear, let's move on to yet another hill. One day Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went up on a mountain once again to pray. While there, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. The three disciples were seeing something of the glory of the shepherd, which he had laid aside in order to undertake his mission of love. We call this hilltop event the Transfiguration. The shepherd of the hills is the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. So the shepherd of the hills is the creator of those hills. 
The next day when they had come down from the mountain, they found the other disciples quarreling with some scribes over what was to be done about a small boy who was being tormented by an evil spirit. The boy's father was distressed and confused by the quarreling. Jesus said to the man, bring your son here. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. So from the Sermon on the Mount to the Valley of Need, from the hills of prayer to the stormy sea of danger, from the Mount of Transfiguration to the crowds of quarreling, the shepherd of the hills spent time in the hills, but on his mission of love, he never forsake, forsook the Valley of Need The next to last hill I want to consider today is the hill of my imagination. The hill of my imagination. Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15, which is our text for today. It's about a shepherd who, though 99 of his sheep are safely in the fold, goes in search of the one sheep that is missing. I've always imagined that it was through the lonely, rugged hills of the Judean wilderness that the Good Shepherd went in search for his sheep. The shepherd in the parable represents the Good Shepherd who told the parable, Jesus Christ, (laughs) the shepherd of the hills. He came all the way from the glories of heaven to the wilderness of the world to seek and to save. He sought and found me when he reached through Doris Helm, the woman I referenced earlier, who taught us about the Savior as she led the Vacation Bible School in the Methodist Church of Tuscola, Illinois. Her husband was the local judge. Our town was the county seat. She stood straight and tall with kind eyes, and she used a flannel graph to explain the steps to become a Christian. And that 11-year-old boy, whose dad was a preacher, nevertheless needed as much as any to be found by the dear Savior. And he was found. (laughs) He was found. And because he was, He has been able to say since that day, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me on paths of righteousness for his his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The shepherd of the hills, I love him. He's my shepherd. And now finally, to the, to the last hill to be considered this morning, I am the last hill to be considered this morning. I am outside the city of Jerusalem. I see a hill shaped something like a skull. I see people clustered around the top of this hill and three crosses 
rising above them. I make my, my way closer and reach the bottom of the hill called Mount Calvary and inquire of a person who is on his way down what is taking place up the hill. He says that they have crucified the man known as Jesus of Nazareth along with two thieves. I think, no, no, that can't be. No, no, not, not this hill. The Sermon on the Mount, yes, that hill, the, the hills surrounding the Sea of Galilee where he went to pray, yes, those hills, the Mount of Transfiguration, of, of course, that hill, the hills of Judea in search of the lost sheep, yes, yes, I get that, but not this hill. This is a hill of humiliation, of agony, of death. What is the shepherd of the hills doing on this hill? I climb the hill. I climb the hill. I take my place among some Roman soldiers, a small group of women, and several other men. I lift up my head and look up at the man on the center cross. I see the crown of thorns pressed down upon his head. I see his outstretched arms with hands nailed to the cross. The shepherd of the hills has arrived at his last hill. It is the hill of destination. It is the hill he was always bound for. His mission of love brought him here. To find the sheep, he had to die for the sheep. He bore their guilt and died their death. I stand there a while, and as I do, I remember a children's story I read years ago. It's entitled, Guess How Much I Love You. It's about a little nut brown hare and his father, big nut brown hare. And they are comparing how much they love each other. For example, little nut brown hare says, I love you this much, and jumps as high as he can. His father responds, and I love you this much. And he jumps as high as he can. At one point in the story, little nut brown hare stretches his little arms wide and says, I love you this much. His dad then stretches out his longer arms as far as he could. And he said, and I love you this much. I am about to turn away when I hear him speak. It is finished, he says. I see him slowly bow his head, and I know that he has died. And I think to myself, this is how much he loves us. And before I leave that terrible hill, the thought comes to me, there's room. There's room in those outstretched arms for me, for you, for everyone. And I know I will never look anywhere else to be made right with God. I won't, I won't look to myself. This little lamb can't save himself. I won't look even to my dear church. Even my church can't save me. I will look only to Jesus Christ who came to save the lost. And I also know that the shepherd's story didn't end at the cross. For early on the morning of the first day of the week, he arose from the dead and left that stony tomb. His body had been placed in on Friday evening because he is alive and calling for us. So let us come to him and be found. 
Let us look to him and live. Let us come to him and be wrapped in the arms of the shepherd of the hills. God bless you and keep you. Let us pray. Thank you. Thank you, dear shepherd. Thank you, dear shepherd of the hills, for this church that you brought into being 40 years ago and have shepherded across those decades and stand ready to continue leading this church on paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.